Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. This is Imam Zaid Shaki, and I'm here on behalf of ISNA. And before proceeding any further, we'd like to thank ISNA and acknowledge the wonderful work they've been doing since uh, their founding over the past several decades. And so the fact that we can say over the past second, several decades indicates ISNA is a well-established, mature institution. It's an institution built on the hard work and sacrifices, the sincere wishes and the dedication uh, to Islam on the part of its founders, on the part of its leaders, past and present, and on the part of the many people who have supported Isna with their prayer, their well wishes, and with their treasure. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He's blessed the Muslims in North America with this organization. Isna is not perfect, so uh, before you start tweeting out Imam Zaid lavishing praise on Isna, Isna is not perfect, but it is an organization, it is an institution that has served the Muslim community in North America for a long period of time in a very, very uh, excellent fashion. There's always room for, room for improvement. And we pray that Allah Ta'ala blesses ISNA to continue its mar march towards uh, bigger and better, as they say. But we thank Allah that we have enjoyed what we have enjoyed from this uh, organization over the past decades. My task today is to talk about social justice, the Muslims' role in that, in, in that. And I, I will preface uh, my remarks by stating that uh, this subject can be approached in one of two ways. It can be approached in several ways, but in, in one or two major ways. One, it can be approached by jumping on the bandwagon of organizations, institutions that uh, have advocated this uh, concept of social justice and situated it in a leftist, neo-Marxist framework that ha at the end of the day has n absolutely nothing to do with the loss of wa ta'ala, with the human soul, uh, because uh, the architects of social justice as we know it, and especially in its latest iteration, its uh, postmodernist iteration, particularly uh, after the uh, advent of activist postmodernism, what we could call activist postmodernism over much of the last two decades, is, uh, has absolutely nothing to do with uh, spiritual life. It has nothing to do with uh, traditional morality. Uh, in fact, one of its stated goals is to undermine or disrupt traditional morality, tra traditional religious institutions, and we should be aware of that. And that's one way we can approach it, though, is through that frame. And that is the framework many Muslims are adopting these days, especially those who have gone uh, through uh, humanities and social science programs at our uh, major institutions, our major colleges and universities, rather. And so we can approach it that way. I choose not to. I choose to approach it and in another way, and that's the second way. And that is a way that looks at the idea of social justice within the framework of Islam, within the framework of our religion. And so from an atheistic, uh, uh, postmodernist point of view, as we said, it has absolutely nothing to do with religion, spirituality, or traditional moral values. In fact, its, its stated mission is to destroy or disrupt all of the, uh, what I mentioned, traditional values, traditional religions, traditional uh, spiritual and moral institutions and standards. That's its stated, its stated mission. And therefore, all there is to justice is social justice. Because it's confined to the world, it's confined to human beings. Some might extend that to uh, animals and protecting and being just with animals in the natural world, which is uh, something we're not against at all. But just to say that it has nothing to do with religion or traditional religious values. Therefore, social justice is justice. 
On the other hand, if we look at it from a traditional Islamic framework, which I prefer to do, social justice is a part of a wider concept of justice. And so uh, to, to really drive that point home, you will not find in classical Islamic literature this term social justice. Uh, it was first popularized amongst the Muslims in the book of Sayyid Qutb al-Adalatul Ijtima'iyatu fil Islam, social justice in Islam. So this term al-Adalatul Ijtima'iyah you won't find in traditional Muslim sources. You will find a concern for justice in society, justice amongst human beings. You will find that in terms of the idea, but the actual term you will not find until the 20th century. So we should be cognizant of that. When I say social justice is a part of a wider scheme of justice from an Islamic perspective, let's situate this, uh, we can situate this in the context of the hadith related by Abi Dharr and Mu'ad ibn Jabal, uh, Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhuma. May Allah be pleased with the two of them uh, when they say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an Abi Dharr wa Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiallahu anhuma qala قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اتق الله حيثما كنت واتبع السيئة الحسنة تمحها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن So be mindful of Allah wherever you are and follow up a misdeed you might do with a good deed being weightier will wipe it out and treat people on the basis of good character so deal with people on the basis of good character. So here there are three realms of justice that are relevant for us as Muslims. The first is justice in our relationship between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. اتَّقِ اللَّهَ حَيْثُ مَا كُنْتُ And so in this realm, mindfulness of Allah leads us to be just in our relationship with Allah. And that is to convey all of the rights that are owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, huquqillah. And so this idea of conveying the rights owed to Allah has been crystallized early on in our history by Al-Hasib al muhasibi the great uh, Baghdadi, but, uh, born and spent his early life in Basra, then moving to Baghdad. Al-Harith al muhasibi uh, who was a contemporary of Imam Ahmed, uh, may Allah have mercy on both of them. Uh, he wrote a book called li Carefully Guarding the Rights Owed to Allah. And so when one violates the rights owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one is being unjust in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greatest act of injustice in this regard is shirk or idolatry. And so Allah Ta'ala uh, states in the Qur'an, إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Shirk or idolatry is the great oppression. إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ Shirk is the great oppression. And again, when we don't have even a belief in Allah, there's no consideration for the rights that are owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the, the modern concept, the postmodern, better yet, concept of social justice being rooted in atheistic thought and totally secularized thought has no consideration for the rights owed to Allah. The second realm is the justice between ourselves and our soul. Justice between ourselves and our soul. And this is captured by the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu And follow up any misdeed you do with a good deed that will eradicate it. And so and essentially what's mentioned, being mentioned here is toba or repentance. So that we do not meet Allah burdened down by a mountain of sin because we have repented from our sins. We've, we've engaged in prayer on a regular basis. We've established regular prayer. We fast Ramadan. And so as they say, uh, the, the daily prayers on a 
daily basis. Juma uh, to Juma, from one Juma uh, prayer to the next on a weekly better basis. Ramadan ila Ramadan, so uh, the month of Ramadan to the next Ramadan on an annual basis wipes out our lesser sins, and so coupled with repentance. We meet a lot without our soul being burdened with sin. And that's justice in our relationship with our soul. So again, we read in the Quran, وَمَن لَمْ يَتُوبْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الظَّالِمُونَ Whoever does not repent, they are the oppressors. And so they are oppressing their very souls. They are, they are oppressing their very souls. And then the, the hadith states, وَخَالِقْ النَّاسَ بِخُلُقٍ حَسَنٍ Deal with people on the basis of good character. This is the realm of social justice. And so I'm not arguing that Islam eliminates social justice. I'm just arguing that it places it in a framework that's wider than human society and human relations. And a framework where the first two Justice uh, in our relationship with Allah and justice in our relationship with our soul uh, provides the parameters for us to understanding what are the limits of social justice. So in other words, let's go back to the, the first understanding where there's no consideration of Allah Ta'ala, no consideration of the soul because it is an atheistic uh, framework and philosophy. In that case, there are no divinely revealed prophetic standards to determine what social justice might involve. When Muslims in, uh, un uncritically jump on that bandwagon, what happens? They advocate, in many instances, for uh, policies, for actions, that would involve sin, therefore uh, angering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and failing, fa failing to convey the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which include implementing, implementing the commandments and avoiding the prohibitions. That whole uh, set of parameters is eliminated in an atheistic framework, which is the framework many Muslims have adopted when they talk about and engage in what they call social justice. Uh, we so, and then secondly, uh, they're advocating for sinful actions, which involves declaring and what Allah has made forbidden to be lawful. And so th this is something that comes back to the detriment of their soul. In the Akhirah, again, those parameters are eliminated in a totally atheistic form of social justice. And, then, and so for the Muslim, those parameters are real. And so we don't advocate for the haram. We don't declare the haram to be halal because of our concern about our relationship with other human beings or other groups or other collectivities. So this is very important. That doesn't mean that we uh, uh, wrong, deny political rights in a pluralistic society, uh, advocate discrimination. No, we don't do any of that, but we make it clear what we believe to be acceptable human actions, acceptable human relationships based on the parameters provided us by our Lord and our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so those two realms, justice in our relationship with Allah, justice in our re relationship with our souls, that, those provide the parameters for us determining what are acceptable uh, realms and what would uh, constitute from our perspective social justice. So we should be very, very aware of that. And we should avoid uh, jumping on bandwagons. And conclude bandwagons that are determined by, in many instances, atheistic, antisocial ideologies at the, end of, at the end of the day. 
And so we have to be discerning. Al mu'min kayyisun wa fatin wa la kisul qutin. So the same word form uh, before the uh, introduction of, of vowels and diacritical marks, the same word can be kayis wa fatin, a believer, al mu'min kayyisun wa fatin. Uh, believers wise and discerning and that same structure could be a bag of cotton al mu'minu kisu qutin so the first is relevant but when we are uncritical when we don't consider the teachings of our religion we become nothing we become a, a bag of cotton just stuff and fluff with no real tangible substance to ourselves and, and in that case, uh, we were amenable uh, to making a lot of mistakes that not only will harm our souls, potentially, but will also bring about a lot of instability in human society. Uh, in conclusion, uh, as we all know, uh, the events unfolding in Afghanistan, we pray for the people there. And, and again, to just uh, uh, illustrate how we can uh, jump on a bandwagon and not really think about the d deeper implications that are neglected when those bandwagons we are jumping on are ideo ideo ideologically determined. And so now you rightly, so don't get me wrong, rightly there's a lot of concern now what's going to happen to girls and women in Afghanistan under the Taliban. We, we pray that a lot of the uh, more reasonable, moderate statements coming from various Taliban spoke, spokespeople about women con continuing in the workplace and journalism and uh, young girls having the ability to go to school. We pray that those are all uh, truthful statements and not part of what some are call, calling a charm of offensive until all of the Americans and foreign troops are gone and then a more nasty, uglier face will be revealed. We pray that those statements are true. So there's right justif justified concern. But those statements now at this time, to a large extent, they're, they're ideologically determined. And they're not part of a wider concern for women and girls in Afghanistan. So why do I say that? If there was a wider concern for girls and women in Afghanistan, when our invasion and occupation and the millions of tons, pound, pounds of bombs that have been dropped on Afghanistan, uh, when d are killing women and girls amongst the men and, and boys that are being killed. Uh, these bombs are in indiscriminate. When they fall on homes, when they bomb wedding parties, the, the damage is indiscriminate. When, when women were being dragged out of their houses out, out in the countryside, in many instances shot during these night raids and, and dragged out in their night clothes, there was absolutely no word, there was no mention of any concern for girls and women in Afghanistan. Why? Because that wasn't part of the ideological framework driving the current concern. So what I'm not saying there should be no concern now. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is Muslims, our perspective should be wider so that we find all of it condemnable. Anything that's threatening, not just the lives of women and girls, but all human beings. Whoever kills an innocent human being, is, 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 it's as if they've killed all of humanity. And so the, our framework is wider. And our framework is centered on the human family. And not the man or the woman necessarily abstracted from a wider social context, and then those particular issues become the focus. The issues are important, but they have to be contextualized. Otherwise, we'll see a deepening of the cleavages that are tearing our society apart, tearing Muslim societies apart. 
And so we see now because of the various ideologies that abstract people from a particular social context, we see the rise of the women's movement. And now the, to counter that, the rise of the men's movement, the red pill movement. We see the rise of black power, white power, woman power, men power, children power, trans power, gay power. And all of these movements are tearing our society apart. And they're destroying the foundation for having a viable social sphere. We, 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 we as Muslims have to look at things from a perspective that brings us together as a society. And so may Allah give us the, the, the wisdom to situate everything happening around us from the movement for social justice, for, from uh, what's going on in Afghanistan or in other parts of not just the Muslim world but the wider world, to situate these things in a wider context that allows us to bring people and societies together and not to be part of efforts that are designed in many instances to tear societies apart. May Allah give us tawfiq and taysir kabul. May Allah accept from everyone. May Allah, as we mentioned, continue to bless Isna. This is Imam Zayd Shakir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.